Let the congregation say amen. amen. Happy Easter, everyone. I'm Pastor Daniel Talenruin. On behalf of my co-pastor, Jill Rohde, we welcome you to worship this morning. And those of you who are online, welcome to worship as well. We gather this morning to celebrate one of the most surprising events in human history, the resurrection of a poor Galilean Jew raised from the clutches of empire and fear. And so we welcome you to this party of purpose to this party of hope, to this party of joy, the party of justice. I ask you to rise as you're able or with your spirit. Draw your attention here to the Paschal candle because we are going to bless it this morning. Siblings in Christ on this most holy day when our Savior Jesus Christ passed from death to life, we gather with the church throughout the world. This is the Passover of Jesus Christ. Through light and the word, through water and oil, bread and wine, we proclaim Christ's death and resurrection, share Christ's triumph over sin and death, and await Christ's coming again in glory. Christ, yesterday and today, the beginning and the ending, to Christ belongs all time and all the ages. To Christ belongs glory and dominion now and forever. Amen. The light of Christ. Be Christ, is risen. Christ is risen. We're going to do this. Yeah, we're going to do this. Christ is risen. Christ is risen. Christ is risen. All right, you passed. Let's sing. <laughs> of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. Let us pray. Tomb burst in God, our joy and our life, you do the most marvelous things. Our names on your tongue set weeping to dancing. Your love disarms death, hearts, and empire alike. And the gates of presumption, which limit the forms life and bodies should take are blown off their hinges today. So attune all our senses and instill expectation. Your presence will leave us still slack-jawed and startled 
as Mary, in great stunned relief, we shout praise at your vibrant emerging. Amen. Amen. You may be seated as we hear God's holy word. The reading is from Isaiah, the 25th chapter. On this mountain, the Lord of hosts will make for all peoples a feast of rich food, a feast of well-aged wines, of rich food filled with marrow, of well-aged wines strained clear. And he will destroy on this mountain the shroud that is cast over all peoples, the sheet that is spread over all nations. He will swallow up death forever. Then the Lord God will wipe away the tears from all faces and the disgrace of his people he will take away from all the earth. For the Lord has spoken. It will be said on that day, lo, this is our God. We have waited for him so that he might save us. This is the Lord for whom we have waited let us be glad and rejoice in his salvation. Word of God, word of life. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Please rise as you're able or with your spirit for the gospel acclamation. chapter when the Sabbath was over Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of James and Salome bought spices so that they might go and anoint Jesus's body and very early on that first day of the week when the Sun had risen they went to the tomb they had been saying to one another who will roll away the stone for us from the entrance of the tomb when they looked up, they saw that the stone, which was very large, had already been rolled back. And as they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in a white robe sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. But he said to them, do not be alarmed. You are looking for Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He has been raised. He is not here. Look, there is the place they laid him. But go, tell his disciples and Peter that he is going ahead of you to Galilee. There you will see him just as he told you. So they went out and fled from the tomb, for terror and amazement had seized them, and they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, Lord Christ. Minnesota, and we had a cabin on Lake Candio High, and we spent a lot of the summer weekends out there, and I just loved all the freedom I had to run around as a kid. As a young age, or at that young age, I was definitely one of the easiest and most compliant kids you would ever meet, so it likely didn't phase my parents one bit when they left me alone that fateful day in the cabin while they went out for a swim. Well, let this be a lesson to you never to let five-year-olds out of your sights, even the sweet and innocent ones, because you just never know. 
So here's what I remember from that day, the summer of 1986. I was rolling around in my parents' bedroom, a little bit bored when I spotted it, the telephone. <laughs> One of those old, boring, light-colored telephones, you know, has the long cord in the wall with the rotary dial, just begging to be used. And so who was I to disappoint that telephone? <laughs> I grabbed it off the stool. I tucked it under my arm. I crawled underneath my parents' bed. I took the receiver off the hook, and I dialed 911. And when the operator answered, 911, what is your emergency? I whispered, there's a dead man in my house. <laughs> and then I probably hung up. Now, to be perfectly clear, there was no dead man in my house. I had never seen a dead man up to that point, and I had no desire to see a dead man. I will never know what possessed me to do and say such a thing. <laughs> now, even at five, I had enough sense that I had just done something that I shouldn't have. So I laid there frozen underneath my parents' bed for a really, really long time until I heard it. I went to go answer the door, and there stood two tall police officers asking for my parents. And the lever of terror I felt just ratcheted up about a thousand percent. Would I be arrested? Would my parents like punish me forever and never let me out of their sight? So I did the walk of shame down to the lake to get my parents to come up to talk to these officers. And as my parents stood facing these officers, I remember hiding behind my dad's leg, trying to make myself as small as possible. Mr. and Mrs. Rohde, said one of the officers, the 911 dispatch received a call from someone in this area reporting a dead man being present in one of these cabins. Do you know anything about that? My parents shook their head, no, we've been swimming, officer. Mr. and Mrs. Rohde, is there any chance that your daughter here would have called? <laughs> now, as four sets of adult eyes shifted their steely gazes upon me, and as my dad very calmly asked me, Jill, did you call 911? I looked him in the eyes, and as any good and proper pastor's kid does, I shook my head no. <laughs> Now, having no evidence to the contrary, the police officers left to go and ask neighboring cabins about this phone call they had received, and my feeling of utter terror was joined then with the feeling of amazement. Amazement that even with all the terror-induced cortisol pumping through my body in that moment that everyone seemed to believe me. Amazement that even if my parents did suspect that I wasn't wholly truthful, that they didn't call me out either during the visit or after the visit, Amazement that I had made it through this very surreal, unresolved, messy experience of my own making, to be clear. And perhaps with the grace of these four adults, with a really great story to tell you this morning. <laughs> now, remembering how I held these double emotions of terror and amazement that day long ago, it, it gave me some great empathy as I prepared for this Easter sermon this morning and reading Mark's account of the resurrection with Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Salome, as they too were feeling both emotions as they dealt with the unresolved mess of their non-existent dead body. And what a mess it was. Just to set the scene, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Salome had just been through a really, really horrific ordeal, watching their teacher and leader their friend, the one that they thought would be the invincible Messiah, experienced a really horrible trial, public denouncement, and a truly painful execution. Their dream for the future had been dashed and was now literally dead. So imagine how their grief of losing this close friend and Messiah and leader would have been compounded when they went to anoint their friend's body and the body was not there the one physical reminder that they had left of their once-held dream of a new reality had vanished. And as for this tale that the young man in the tomb told them of Jesus' dead body being raised, like if there is one rule in life that these women followed, it's that dead means dead. <laughs> Nothing in their previous experience would have allowed for them to entertain such a wild and incomprehensible thought. 
So the emotions they felt of terror and amazement, they make a lot of sense. Their unresolved, messy response to flee from the tomb and not saying anything to anyone seems pretty rational to me. For when a person experiences a horrible situation or a string of horrible experiences as they had, it's only human nature to respond with fight, flight, freeze, or fawn. And they chose to flee from the unresolved mess. And I wonder this morning, who among us cannot relate to feeling terror and amazement about our present circumstances in the world today and wanting to flee? To want to call 911 and have someone else deal with the mess? To turn off the news and disengage? To check out? To feeling so weary and overwhelmed by the need and the hate in the world that we find ourselves stuck in inaction? I mean, after all, we have a Christian nationalist movement that is growing more powerful and threatening our democracy. We have a candidate for president who's selling God bless the USA Bibles. We have a heart-wrenching, awful war raging between Israel and Hamas that has killed over 31,000 people, over 30,000 of which have been Palestinians with no end in sight. We have our refugee and immigrant team right here at St. Anthony Park Lutheran distributing thousands of pounds of food every week and our free little food pantry often sitting empty, which is all great, but it points to a deeper reality that even in our abundance of living in this great country, we still cannot figure out how to feed and house our neighbors. We have racism baked into nearly every system that is meant to help in our school systems, in our law enforcement, and criminal justice system, in our local governments, and yes, even in the church. We have transphobic laws pushing through state governments at record speeds. We have a women's right to receive medical care under attack. Just one of these issues, just one. Not to mention all of them compounded and happening all at the same time are enough to make even the steadiest person lose their balance and buckle under terror and amazement. And if you're like me, you might feel shell-shocked and not sure how to proceed, wanting like the women in our gospel lesson to flee this messy world in fear, to abdicate my responsibility as a public leader and as a U.S. citizen and as a Christian, to disengage and not say a word to anyone. Now, Pastor Jill, you might be wondering, is this a Good Friday sermon? Or is it an Easter sermon? Because you're painting a pretty dreary picture for us. And indeed, I am. Because I believe that one of our calls as Christians is to face the hard stuff head on. To not go under it, or over it, or around it, but to go straight through it. We are called to face our messy Good Friday world and to wrestle with our dual feelings of terror and amazement and figure out how to engage. Because, my friends, the story is not done. Our story does not end at Good Friday, which is why we're all sitting here this morning. Can I get an amen? amen. We get to be a part of the, how the story unfolds from this point on. I mean, weren't you even a little bit curious this morning listening to the gospel account, how the resurrection story from Mark's gospel ends in such an unsatisfying, open-ended manner? The women were afraid, and they fleed and didn't tell a soul the gospel of the Lord. What kind of Easter story is that? It's messy. It's unfinished, and I bet it fills us with a bit of unease, for it's in human nature to want a nice and neat resolution. It's why my dad, even 30 years later, after my fateful 911 call years ago, has throughout the, year, has throughout the years asked, so why did you make that call? <laughs> what were you thinking? We want to be able to fill in the blanks about the unresolved questions and situations. We want to be able to go home after Easter today, celebrate with our family with a happily ever after ending to the Easter story. But I wonder, given the gospel that we hear from Mark this morning, in the absence of a nice and neat and happily ever ending after <clears throat> ending this morning, what would it look like instead to just sit 
in this unfinished Easter story of terror and amazement? What would it look like to acknowledge our discomfort and to acknowledge our yearning for something to be different? What would it look like for us to try and proclaim a message of Easter hope and resurrection to be an Easter people in our Good Friday world? Because make no mistake, while the Gospel of Mark tells us that the women in their terror and amazement said nothing to no one, I mean, they did eventually tell someone something. Otherwise, how else would we know about this wonderful story of the resurrection of Jesus today if not for the faithful women who pushed through their discomfort and pushed through their fear, who pushed through the mess of the world to bear witness to a living Jesus and to a living God who is still at work transforming us and transforming this world. You see, the message of Easter and the resurrection, it isn't just for funerals and the dying and the dead. It's equally a message for all of you here today, the living. And I'm not saying it's an easy message to embrace, that hope and resurrection is even possible or present in this hurting world, but on my best days, dear siblings, on my best days when I can grab hold of resurrection hope, and embrace the promises of resurrection, I truly believe that there will be peace in the Middle East. I truly believe that my children will have a clean and healthy planet to raise their children in. I truly believe that the poor and the unhoused will have a safe place to lay their heads in a belly full of food. I believe that the stigma around mental health will lift and that we will be able to have an honest conversation about anxiety and depression. I believe that the Christian nationalist voices of a few will be drowned out by the Christian and non-Christian love of the many. I believe that we won't always be a country so divided and that instead of having blue states and red states and purple states, that we'll just be the United States. I believe that across all races and cultures and ethnicities, we will, in the words of Martin Luther King Jr., be able to work together, be able to pray together, to struggle together, to go to jail together, to stand up for freedom together, knowing that we will one day be free. You see, I believe that everything will be all right in the end. And if it's not yet all right, it's not yet the end. And I don't believe this because I have some great faith in humanity, no offense. (laughs) But in despite of our shortcomings, I believe in our God who promises that Good Friday is not the end of the story, that death will not win, that the best is yet to come. For there is no place, no place, however messy and full of death, that God cannot infiltrate and transform. I recently just finished a book. um, It's called uh, What Happened to You? And uh, in this book, it's about brain trauma and resilience and I highly recommend it to you. And in this book, they uh, talked about a little vignette about this man named Anthony Ray Hinton. And Anthony Ray Hinton is a black man who spent 30 years on death row in Alabama for a crime that he didn't commit. 30 years. Now, he's written a book, and he's done lots of interviews talking about his experience. And he, he talks about how the prison setup that he was in for those 30 years was so, just so isolating. He was alone in a cell unable to see any of the other inmates on the row with him. No one ever really talked to one another, but at night, you could hear the men crying and moaning. Talk about a messy place with no resurrection hope. Now one night, Anthony heard someone crying and something inside him shifted. He called out, hey, what's wrong? And the man told him that his mother had died. Now, Anthony was very close to his own mother, and in that moment, he empathized. And that one question, what's wrong? That one act of compassion opened the door for all the men on the row. They began talking to one another regularly, sharing stories, giving one another support. And during this time, Anthony became particularly friendly with a man named Henry. And through their talking back and forth, Anthony learned that his friend Henry was actually Henry Hayes, a member of the KKK who'd been in prison for hanging a young black boy. 
But instead of cutting him off and ending the friendship, Anthony formed a bond with him on death row, and they remained close friends. And on the night that Henry was set to be executed, his last words were these, that all of his life, he'd gotten it wrong. That his parents had taught him wrong, saying that black people were the enemy. And Henry confessed that it took him coming to death row for him to learn what love was. It's often in the messiest of places that we find glimmers of resurrection hope. It reminds me of that great Leonard Cohen lyric, there's a crack in everything, and that's how the light gets in. Dear siblings in Christ, on this Easter, we are called to take death head on because God has promised that it's not the end of the story. The very first verse of the Gospel of Mark declares this is the beginning. The beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. You may think that Easter is the grand culmination of the Christian witness and story, but I'm here to remind you that it's just getting started. And you all get to play a part in the grand arc of justice that God has already started in motion. And if you can just sit in the messiness of the world's terror and amazement, in your own terror and amazement long enough. The promise of Christ is that you might just catch a glimpse of resurrection. And what a sight to behold when peace, love, justice, and joy transform hearts and transforms the world. So do not be afraid. Be bold in faith, be bold in mercy, be bold in love. For Jesus has been raised from the dead and he has gone on ahead of you, which means that there is no place you can go where Jesus isn't already present. Wherever your terror and amazement take you, wherever death and resurrection may lead you, Jesus is there healing, transforming, and making all things new. Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. Alleluia. Amen.
us tell the story of our faith using the words of our sisters, brothers, and siblings from the United Church of Canada. We are not alone. We live in God's world. We believe in God who has created and is created, who has come in Jesus, the Word made flesh, to reconcile and make new, who works in us and others by the Spirit. We trust in God. We are called to be the church, to celebrate God's presence, to live with respect in creation, to love and serve others, to seek justice and resist evil, to proclaim Jesus, crucified and risen, our judge and our hope, in life and in death, in life beyond death. God is with us. We are not alone. Thanks be to God. Amen. And so rejoicing that Jesus is risen and love has triumphed over fear and violence, let us pray for the church, the world, and all those in need of some good news today and every day. We are resurrection people, amen? amen. And so we pray for the earth, our good creation. Join our prayers with branches lifted in praise and roaring waters of new life, that together we may proclaim Easter hope Hasten our caretaking of this world we've been given through courageous discipleship and an ongoing resurrection spirit. God of grace. We are resurrection people. Amen? Amen. We pray for all peoples and nations. We pray for Ukraine and Russia. We pray for the Sudan and for Haiti. We pray for the migrants and refugees on our border and all borders. We pray to free oppressed communities from occupation, exploitation, and abuse. Teach leaders your way of justice. Empower peacemakers and all who work to end violence and strife. We pray especially for peace groups like Standing Together and the Parents Circle, brave Israelis and Palestinians who are struggling in solidarity right now for the sake of a lasting peace in the Holy Land, crying out for a ceasefire, for the release of Jewish hostages, and for an end to the bombing, starvation, and illegal seizure of land from the Palestinian population in Gaza and the West Bank. God of grace, hear our prayer. We are resurrection people, amen? amen? We pray for people everywhere who long for good news. Roll away the stones that keep people from living with dignity and wholeness. Breathe new life and hope into people struggling to make it through every day, whether it's through isolation, sickness, death of a loved one, depression, anxiety, anger, or any issue that prevents them from living an abundant life. God of grace. We are resurrection people. Amen? Amen. Send your spirit upon this congregation in a time of polarization and misinformation that we might reach out to understand those with whom we disagree, taking the log out of our own eye, and simultaneously concentrate on the weightier matters of the law as Jesus challenged his opponents to fill this world with more mercy and compassion, to populate everyone's hardened hearts with more trust in God and in one another, and to fight in your name for more justice alongside those who are oppressed. God of grace. We are resurrection people, amen? amen? And so we pray for our Muslim siblings as they continue to celebrate the discipline and stubborn hope of Ramadan, that our Jewish siblings had a spirited and hope-filled festival of Purim, for our Hindu siblings celebrating their spring festival of Holi, and our Zoroastrian siblings celebrating their festival of Kordad Sal. Allow our differences to serve the spirit of delight in one another and the diversity of love and justice we all wish to see in this world. God of grace. We are resurrection people, amen? amen? And so we pray for this community of faith, for all who are sick and suffering, especially for Ed and Katie, Peggy, Rosemarie, Kim, Susan, Larry, Colette, Dennis, Paul, Sarah, Marie, Kari, Liv, Dave, Beverly and Dave, Erica, Don and Georgia, Priscilla, Nancy, Sharon, Mike, Karen, Barrett, Marin, and Jim. And we pray for your spirit of healing in everyone's midst. Feed us at this Easter table and fill us with your wisdom that we may serve and care for one another. God of grace. One more time. We are resurrection people. Amen? Amen. We remember those who've gone before us in death. 
Renew our trust in your promises that we live with joyful courage and compassion, surrounded by the communion of saints, God of grace. Hear our prayer. And so into your hands, most merciful God, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your abiding love. Through Jesus Christ, our resurrected and living Lord and liberator, let all say, Amen. Amen. And now may the peace of Christ be with you always. Share a loving sign of peace with one another, and please greet someone you don't know this morning. And for those of you online, we say the peace of Christ be with you as well. to be together this Resurrection Sunday. Amen? Amen. Welcome, everyone, uh, whether you're online or with us in person. Uh, we're so blessed to display this intergenerational art above us, these flowers. They were facilitated by Miss Molly and her kids and their parents. They worked on them for the season of Lent. And can we get a round of applause for Joshua, the Jennifers, all the volunteers who worked to make this space so <laughs> Y'all made it so bright and resurrecty this morning. Is that a word? I just made that up. And speaking of all the beauty around us, thanks to all those who purchased these beautiful flowers in memory of loved ones. You can check the list. Um, it's printed on page seven of your bulletin for all the dedications. Our special ministry grants are due by the end of the day. So please look back at that Friday email for the Google link if you'd like to submit a grant application. Uh, tomorrow, the office will be closed, but we'll be back open on Tuesday. Community meals will just keep going here. So we're starting them up again this Wednesday at 5.30 p.m., so come for the community meal. And for adult education in April, we're doing a slew of sessions on faith and public life, so don't miss them. Starting next Sunday, Kevin Dragseth, 
reintroduces our collective work on anti-racism in the church. We'll dig into the ELCA social statement on faith and politics with other related sessions to follow. For communion this morning, you'll be led by an usher section by section down the uh, diagonal aisles. Uh, Pastor Jill and I will have bread, and you can take a piece, and then you can either intinct in wine or grape juice, or you can drink from the common cup, where someone will just turn and wipe for the next person. And also, we have gluten-free wafers with wine and grape juice on the tables. Please check your bulletin for some more announcements. And thank you for being here in person or online. And if you're visiting in person, we ask you fill out a welcome card. They're in the red hymnal. There's a contact card there. and Just drop it in the usher's plate so we can welcome you. We'll continue now with our offering. And we thank you for your gifts of abundance and joy as we prepare for the Eucharist this morning. spirit as we receive the gifts let's pray the offering prayer printed in your bulletin together risen one you call us amen thanks be to God for your gifts of abundance 
time and talent and money or presence here with us this morning. We dedicate this offering to God. And thanks be to God for your presence. People, are you ready? Yes, ready. People, are you ready? Oh, yes, we are. People, are you ready? Oh, yes, we're ready. Ready to praise the Lord. Come on, Southside, help me. Southside, are you ready? Yes, we're ready. Southside, are you ready? Oh, yes, we are. Southside, are you ready? As we come to the table, we remember that even on the night of his betrayal, Jesus practiced abundant welcome. For in that room there were friends and enemies, in that room there were believers and deniers, and yet Jesus called them all together to share in the Passover meal. And after they'd eaten, Jesus took the bread, gave thanks, blessed it, and broke it. He said to each one of them, take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, and after giving thanks, he blessed and poured it. He said, take and drink. This cup is the new covenant sealed in my blood. Do this in remembrance of me. My dear friends, every time we come to this table to share the bread of life and the cup of hope, we recall Jesus into our presence. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Now you. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. 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 Let us pray the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father in heaven. Hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial, and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. And now the gifts of God for the people of God for the life of the world. Thanks be to God. 
the risen Christ is made known to us in the breaking of the bread. Come and eat at God's table. You may be seated. And for those of you who are worshiping online, we say the words, the body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ given and shed for you.
Please rise as you're able or with your spirit for the blessing. And now the body and blood of our Lord and liberator Jesus Christ strengthens you and keeps you in God's grace. Amen. Amen. We'll pray the post-communion prayer together. Shepherding God, you have prepared a table before us and nourished us with your love. Send us forth from this banquet to proclaim your goodness and share the abundant mercy of Jesus, our Redeemer and friend. Amen. And now receive this blessing. Alleluia, Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. Alleluia. The God of resurrection power, the Christ of unending joy, and the spirit of Easter hope bless you now and always. Amen. Amen.